D. Just want to tell you I'm thankful for all that you have done for the stars and the moonlight and the setting sun when my work on earth is through I'm going home
59 in the red book?
Same book, number 67 in the red book.
जी Somehow forgotten. I'll try my You'll do it again. She'll do it again. If you just take a walk at where you were now and where you've been. Oh, has he always come true? forgotten that you were faced with certain senses that you can't just get through right now it seems that there's no way out and you're going and under but God's 
prove time and time again He'll take care of you the stars, the sun and the sea, and he is your father. He'll calm the storm, and he'll find a way to fix it for you. Somehow forgotten that you are faced with circumstances that you just can't get through. Right now it seems that there's no way out and you're going under. But God proven time and time again, He'll take care of you. Just take a walk at where you are now and where you've been. Oh, has he always come true for you? He's the same now as then. Oh, you may not know how, you may not know when, but you do it again. Oh, yes, you do it again. Just take a walk at where you are now and where you've been. Oh, has he always come true for you? He's the same now as then. Oh, you may not know how, you may not know when, but you do it again. Just take a walk at where you are now and where you've been. Oh, has he always come true for you? He's the same now as then. Oh, you may not know how, you may not know when, but you do it again.
to see everyone here this morning. Doesn't sound too good. Down this road I can see A bright light shining for me It's far away But the pull is strong Someday this old road won't be so long so when that morning finally gets here, when I reach my journey's end, I'll be waiting at the gate for Him to open and let me in. I have seen a lot of signs that have led me to this place, and I know. There's peace in knowing, Lord, you're in control. You got your hand on my life. You got a hold on my soul. There's joy abundant, I just have to tell. I'm drinking sweet water from your living well. There's peace. your hand on my life you got a hold on my soul there's joy abundant i just have to tell i'm drinking sweet water from your living well you're my shelter my cup 
Please see Brenda.
you can't go on He'll carry you through your sorrow And he'll carry you through your pain And I know
I'll never leave nor forsake you So keep pressing on Towards your heavenly home sisters I see yes <laughs> standing at the Jordan and I'm gazing toward Mount Zion I see the throng that's gathering and I hear the people sighing This journey has been so long But the travelers, they're so strong There's something going on There's something going on There's something going on, going on In Mount Zion What's that song they're singing? What's that song? Well, something's going on, going on in Mount Zion. Saints are coming home. There's something going on. Well, I've made my preparation to enter Mount Zion by grace, through faith in the one who made Way. And now he's my father and his is my father and as he gives there'll be something going on something's going on going on in Mount Zion what's that song they're singing what's that song By grace, through faith, in the one who paved the way. And now he's my brother, and his father is my father. And as he bids me come, there'll be something going on. Oh, something's going on, going on in Mount Zion. What's that song there? What's that song? Well, something's going on, going on in Mount Zion. Things are coming home. Something's going on. I know that something's going on, going on in Mount Zion. What's that song they're singing? What's that song?
Lord. Times they are changing. No, the hour didn't change. That's in the spring. But praise the Lord. Just the same. Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of the service, Lord, I just pray, Lord, as we will look into your word. Use this vessel of clay you would see fit, Lord. We thank you for thy precious word in the hour that we live in. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. Still on the subject of the Godhead, how that God is omnipotent, omnipotent, I should say, omnipresent, omniscience. Now that He knows all things, he, He's everywhere present, nowhere absent, and He's all powerful. And again, in order to be those three qualities, you can't have a form. You can't have a body. You have to be just a spirit. And the spirit of God is his thoughts. God has a soul. And because he has a spirit... And he has a soul, then he's not limited by space or time. He lives in a realm that you and I don't hardly comprehend of. And as we look at that great Heavenly Father that you and I have, he saw you and I before the foundation of the world. He saw every thought before the foundation of the world. There's not a thought that he don't know. And I'm thankful that he does. And I love that scripture when uh, it's been a long time ago that I came across it, that only God sees the heart. No angels, no man, not even Jesus, unless the Father is speaking to him to show it what it is. But as we were looking to the scripture, how great our God is, there's things that we need to look at in, in certain aspects of God's word. If we go back, how God in the beginning... Before he created that big bang. And it's hard for us to fathom how how much power that would have to be used to create this universe. And the universe that we live in now, we are five billion the earth was made about five billion years ago. But between 13.5 to 5 billion, a lot of things took place. And the earth keeps expanding all the time. As a matter of fact, if you were going to cross the universe, and if you could travel at the speed of light, it wouldn't be a year, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000, a million. It would take you 93 billion at the speed of light to go across this whole universe. My mind can't phantom that. I hear the number. But that's the natural world. God fills the spiritual world. And one thing we that we read certain scriptures we can catch certain points that's in the, in the scripture and we read it sometimes, we don't fully comprehend the vastness of what God 
is. Because in the beginning, before the earth ever started, God did not fumble in the dark. He lit up the spirit world. And if he lit up the spirit world, yes, he is light, but he is also light that it's in if you and I were to pass over into glory. We won't have our physical sun. There's no stars, nothing to, there's no planets there. There's nothing tangible and physical in the spirit world. And so therefore the source to illuminate is that presence and spirit of God that does it. Now there's something that really, when we start looking at it, as he lights up that whole spirit, spirit world, and when we look at God before the creation, time did not exist. In order for time to exist, there has to be something tangible made either in the natural world or in the spirit world. And it has to be made in such a way that in the natural world, as you travel, you travel in time. You came to church this morning. It took some time to travel from there to here. But if there was nothing, then there would be no time. So God lives in a dimension where time doesn't exist. So the past, the present, and the futures is all the same to him. How do we comprehend that? I don't know. Until we get over there, we'll find out when that time comes. But I'm thankful that he is. Now, the reason I'm going about it this way here this morning, yes, God lights up the spirit world. Now, the sun and the planets didn't start from day one from the Big Bang. It took almost 8 billion years to reach there. And there, too, we look at, well, we, see, we look with our eyes in the hour that we live in. Oh, God made the planets. He made the stars. He made the galaxies and all those things that are in the world. He's the author of it. But God didn't start when the Big Bang started. Well, I'm going to form this planet over here. Five, five billion years later and I'll make a sun over here and I'm going to put a star over there and I'm going to put a galaxy over here. God didn't do such thing. What God did, he said, they behave by the ordinances, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing the word, or the laws, he created the laws which things are that the material world is governed by. And by those laws, that's all he had to do. He just create the raw material and put those laws how the material is going to behave. And in time, those laws would form stars, planets, and galaxies. And it's not the law under the Ten Commandments that has nothing to do with it. What are the laws that God did use at that hour? Or when he was thinking about creating this universe? Well, one of the laws is called gravity. How many have heard of gravity? Man used the name gravity but doesn't understand it yet. How can something like a galaxy, be held together. Magnetism. Now here's a big word, thermodynamic. Heat is what it is. Fusion, nuclear fusions. Force and motion, Relatively, relativity, how things behave in time as things expand. And of course, at the base of all this is mathematics. God's the greatest mathematician that there is. Man discovered those laws. Man didn't create those laws. He just came across them and gave them a name. 
But those are the laws that God created this universe with. All you had to do is step back. And let that, he's, yes, the origin of the creator of that Big Bang. Of all the material that was going to be used for the universe. And all he had to do is speak his laws into place, and these things start to happen. And, some, and then we think, well, oh, he created the universe. That happened in maybe, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. No, he didn't. It took a while. How many of you know what a hydrogen molecule is? Do you know what hydrogen is? It's a gas. Well, maybe for some of you, it may be easier to understand. Do you know what oxygen is? Something you breathe. You can't see it? Well, oxygen has more molecules than the hydrogen atom has. And in the beginning, when, the, when it, that started, him creating all the material that would be used or whatever would form this universe, you had hydrogen atoms. And because of magnetism and gravity, they started to pull together. And when enough of them got pulled together, it's created gigantic stars which would be bigger than our solar system. And when that much of hydrogen gets together, then it caused a gravity. And if you were standing on the, not that you could stand there, but you couldn't even exist. You'd be crushed by the weight or the gravity that's pulled on it. So the, the gravity is pulled so hard that it causes the atoms to cause a reaction like a nuclear reaction. That's what our sun is, a nuclear reactor. And so therefore, why would God go through that process? When God started the Big Bang, he didn't create right from the get-go gold, platinum, uh, carbon, oxygen, all those elements. He didn't form them when the Big Bang started. Over here. But because of the laws he put in place, as those great big stars would got together, big stars made of hydrogen, as its reaction would take place and it starts to explode, the atoms would hit each other and then it caused helium, oxygen, carbon, that's how those elements that we see in our periodic table exist. Now, it's not going where I was wanted to go this morning. I'll just follow the thought through anyway. So all these things were created about 10 billion years ago. There was a great big stars, which we couldn't live in that era of time. But it was God's chemistry of making the different elements that we have in the world. And some elements are pretty heavy, like uranium. Gold is somewhat heavy, too. Because if you have a brick of gold, it weighs quite a bit. So those big elements, they happen when the big star happened to explode and cause a supernova. The, the pressure is so great that you and I can't even fathom the forces involved that what actually crushes those, those atoms that it forms a new element. And when they explode out, it's thrown out as, well, I don't want to use the word dust because it's not all dust, but all those elements would spread forth and they fly out through the universe. Then finally when all this dust comes together, then it forms the sun and it forms our planets. Our planet has all those elements, but because God in his chemistry set 10 billion years ago when he created those big stars, that's how every element we have that man knows on the planet was made back then. Not in the day of the Big Bang, 13 billion years ago, but 10 billion years ago. Then when that was settled, then everything was in place. Now God could form smaller stars and planets and galaxies that we know today. I know this is kind of scientific, but I'm using that as a base for something else here this morning. That's the natural side of things. All right? A thought came to me while I was waking up this morning. 
we talk about the natural world, now we're talking about the spiritual, spiritual side of things. The first beings ever to be created was your angelic families, whether cherubims, archangels, guardian angels. They were created, and according to the scripture, they were created when 3.8 billion years ago, because when Lucifer, being the, the chief, the highest angel of the whole family, it says his Garden of Eden, or his beginning, was when there was fires of stone being created. While there are gems and whatnot that we have on the planet, they were formed when the earth crust was being formed. Now that's a long time. If you take 3.8 billion years, it would be 3.8 billion years before God even decides to put man, create man. Right? And man was created in the spirit world. And so when God created man in the spirit world, he took a bit of his, the spirit that he is, and he made Adam in the spirit world, not on the earth. He was in the, on the sixth day that he was created. That spirit that he put in Adam, again, is not the born again experience. It was a spirit of life that would give him life and then God gave him also of his image, which is the soul, that he could have a characteristic that, because if it was just spirit alone, then everybody would be the same. You wouldn't know Adam from anything. It would just be like, whatever. But as he's created in the spirit world, angels were created the same way. But they were created with a greater amount of the spirit and also angels have a soul because Michael is not Gabriel and Gabriel is not other, other angels that are in the family of God and so therefore when God created the angelic family like it was 3.8 billion years ago but now we're bringing it to the family of man and here's something so simple When God created Adam, he's the first one of the family of man, isn't he? Then Jesus could not be a second Adam if he was created way long before Adam was made 6,000 years ago. Follow the thought? It would be... Why call him a second Adam if he was created in the eternity past? It doesn't hold water. Otherwise, we'd have to say, God, take that scripture out where he was the second Adam. The, being the second Adam in the mind of God, by predestination, he knew everyone that would be created from the days of Adam till you get to the eternal age. But in the mind of God, we were there. By foreknowledge, he knew one day he would have to send a Savior to save you and I. But he didn't start with the Savior. He started with the first Adam. And so those that believe in the Trinity, you better cross out in your Bible that, Adam was, that Jesus was the second Adam. I mean, it's so simple. It's like... Once you see it, and I keep going back to that simile or that part I seen on a, a show when I was young about Marco Polo and, and the egg, how that rich nobility were just snubbing him and making mocking of him. And so he thought, well, time to, to see what, if they're really that smart. And he said, well, who can make an egg stand on its end? Now, I had one lately, and I tried it. It works. So they were, they were putting, taking the eggs in, they were it's all fumbling, and, they, and they, there might have been about 20 or 30 of them around the table. And they said, well, it can't be done. We're smart. In other words, they were saying, we're smarter than you, you're trying to trick us. It's, it's not, it can't be done. He picks up the egg, gives it a little tap, it stands up. Well, anybody can do that. 
That's the same things as tares looking at God's truth. They look at you down as nothing. But God makes it so simple. Praise the Lord. Because once it's opened to your eyes, it's not complicated. Just like this here. If God created Adam in the spirit world on the sixth day, where was Jesus? He wasn't there. But God had a time when he would be born. And he'd be born without sin because that's why he's called the second Adam. And he'd be the first of the new creation of God's creation, not in Genesis, but he's the first one of that new creation of God. He's the first one to be in fill or baptized, if you want to use that, that terminology, baptized with the Spirit of God. He's the first one. That's why he has preeminence. He has preeminence because of that family of his that God wanted, was looking for to begin with. And then when we look back in the, day, the days of Adam, he was created on that sixth day. God rested the seventh. That's a thousand years. And he was put on the earth on the eighth day. Or our first day of thousand years that we are now in six thousand years of time. And then you'll have some in the denominational world well, we don't believe all that stuff. It doesn't matter what it is. The, God created things, everything in, in six days. Six day creation. I mean, you have some people that are doctors of divinity that study things, but they study with their mind being, if you want to twist it, that Satan will only get them to look in that and they'll be so adamant, they couldn't care less if truth, there was a pile load of truth in front of them. Oh, what? No, no, no. Everything, all, the, all those animals went on the ark. Well, what about the dinosaurs? Well, we don't know about them things. <laughs> well, God does. There's a way that God brings things forth in the hour that we live in. Now, as he brings Adam on the earth, like I said, when he did put him on the earth... Adam was not a vegetable. He did not, well, wow, what's this area that I'm in now? I just come out of the spirit world now. Now you form me out of the dust of the earth, Lord, and what's all this about? No, he had a thousand years to look at. And when you look back at time, I often wonder sometimes, why in the days of Adam and, or even after Adam and Noah, why were they looking at the stars? Where would they get that knowledge? Well, Adam knew. And in Genesis, God said that the, sun, that the sun was there for the day, night or day, one cycle, that the moon was for months, and the stars was for years. And Job talks about the different type of constellations that are there, that they... They are there to govern, to know when, a certain period of time in the year. But God didn't want man to go looking at them to find something else that God didn't want them to play with. Adam didn't go building, pie, building charts for star charts or, or those different things they call them. But he knew they were there. So when Adam was created... God called the angels to come and have a look to, to see how Adam was created. He didn't need the angels to come with him to see oversee why, how Adam was made. Because there was not a man made before God created Adam. But as God is bringing the angelic family, it's because he knew in his plan that, yes, Adam would fall. But he also knew that the angels had a part to play in the family of man. 
They would have to know not what color eyes you have, how much hair you have, how high, and how much weight you, you let, or whatever, any of those things. But he wanted to know how man was operate inside so he could guide him. Use, and that's why we have guardian angels. We have ministering spirits. They're not there to make us grow more hair. Or take out the aging effect. But they're there to guide the soul. To watch over. So to watch over something, it's, it's like, well, like with something you and I talk about, when it's, there's nothing more nerve-wracking when you go on a new job, you don't know what, they don't tell you anything, and you don't know what you need to do. So that's why you had the angelic family to come in place, so they would know how to deal with man as God would put him on the earth. All right. So now man comes into play. And man, we know that Adam and Eve died all, because after they sinned, it was appointed once for them to die. Had Adam not sinned, somewhere in time, he would have received the headship like Jesus had. He had, was given the headship to uh, rule the earth when God put him on the earth. Now, did, uh, was God going to put a super-duper power like a bolt of lightning in Adam to do that? No. He would do the same thing that what Jesus does. The Father would speak to him, and God would perform it. Because the power is with God. Isn't that what Jesus said when he walked on the earth? I do nothing except what the Father shows me or tells me. He does the work. It's his word. In Deuteronomy 18 that you spoke about uh, on Thursday night, God's, Moses said that God would send a prophet like unto him, and him God would speak and would put his word in him and, and give him the commandment that what he should do. Jesus was not given power without any restraint. There was going to be God's plan. It's God's plan. So now as we have man on the scene, as man dies... He don't go into the spirit world. He goes into the lower part of the earth. Held captive because man has sinned. Now, because man sinned, it took a perfect sacrifice to pay the price for man. And that's why Jesus had to come. But then when Jesus came and died on the cross for you and I, and Jesus is the most important figure. That's why he's so important in the scripture. Without God sending his only begotten son that could die for you and me, there's no way we would ever have anything considered even to be into heaven or any form. But because he died for you and I, he is God, he's our redeemer in the sense that his blood paid the price for our sin. But it's the Father redeeming you and I through him to show the plan how God wants to accomplish our salvation. And I'm thankful that God's plan is perfect. Because in it all, there's that free will part that takes place. So as man now, after Jesus' resurrection, those that was in the paradise part of hell are now found in, in the spirit world. And in that spirit world... From the days of, from the early church, till we come down to the end of time that we're living in now. Isaiah speaks about a scripture that the light, that's Isaiah chapter 30, verse 26, that the light of the moon, of the moon will be like the light of the sun. And the light of the sun will be sevenfold in the days the towers fall 
And that's not the Twin Towers in 9-11 that took place that God's speaking about. That's right over here. That'll be right over here. Sorry. It speaks about the term when the towers fall. That's at the end of the week of Daniel. The bride will have come in this hour to sevenfold more light than the early church did. That don't mean you, have, you and I have sevenfold more of the Holy Ghost. We have it by measure like, like they did as well. But there would be sevenfold more understanding of the plan of God here at the end time. The bride reaches that when she comes right to her rapture. But after the rapture, that's where the Jews is going to go from the, the light of the moon, which was as types and shadow, into knowing what Jesus Christ is, their Savior. And that will be done in that first three and a half years of that 70th week of Daniel. So when the scripture talks about Isaiah, when the towers fall, well, at this point in time, the Jews will have the light of one day. But the bride will have the light of seven days. Now, there'll be sevenfold light. In the spirit world now, is the spirit world going to be seven times brighter? Is that what it's referring to? Because it'll be sevenfold more light? No, it's because of the bride. It's sevenfold more light of understanding of the plan of God. Because remember, when God created the, the universe and set in motion the spirit world, he lights up the spirit world. He's not like a light bulb that you have with a, a control that you can bring up the, the, the intensity of the light and bring it down. God remains the same. He never changes, right? So his brightness that he had in the spirit world when, from the beginning is still the same brightness. But when you and I go up in glory, there's going to be sevenfold light. It's because of the light of understanding of the word of God that we are there in glory. And when you take that now to the book of Revelation, talking about the light, they're not talking about the natural light. How many remember? If we were, here's this planet that we are, Earth, over here. In order to have sevenfold physical light, the Earth would have to be where the planet Mercury is. And where the planet Mercury is, it's pretty hot there. Matter of fact, so hot that you can't live there. I don't know if I put it in here or not. But Mercury is around 450 degrees centigrade. To the bride that has a resurrected body, no problem whatsoever. Those, the natural things won't hurt you because you have a spiritual body. You have a resurrected body. But those poor millennium subjects would have a, a hard go. Even though they go into the eternal age, they go into the eternal age like Adam had not sinned, he would have lived eternally. So these, more, these moral subjects that are in the millennium that passes through the judgment of God, they will be subject to heat. And so therefore, the sevenfold light has nothing to do with the physical light in that period of time. Now, oops, she hit the wrong button. Well, maybe I'll use an, another chart instead of that one. When Jesus walked on earth, 
And he was filled with the Spirit. He was filled with all the attributes of God. There was no limitation on that way. He was filled with the characteristic that he could commune with God. And he would have free access to God. But it would take God to operate everything that he received in the fullness. And in the river Jordan, he received the spirit without measure. Did he receive all knowledge then? And when he went to the cross of Calvary and he rose from on high, did Jesus know everything? He knew a lot of things, though. Sometimes more than what we realize. While he walked here on earth, he knew about, he spoke in parables, which he got it from his heavenly father. Now, a parable does not give you details, does it? Not that I'm aware of, anyway. There are things that are mentioned that we can relate to to some point. But you take the parables of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. There's seven parables. That spans this time here the, of the grace age or the Gentile age. But in those parables, you can only see so far. He spoke about concerning in Matthew 25, and I believe it's around verse 14 to 27 or something like that in that area, that he spoke about how that he would come and give rewards to the servants because Matthew 25 has its origin when he's speaking about rewards, he's speaking about how the servants would be starting from his day, from that day, from when he, after he went on high, till the time that the seventh seal is broke. But it's mainly predominantly talking about what conditions that these servants or the, the bride would receive at the end, because the reward comes at the end. So when you look at the rewards given to the, if you want to, the bride of that hour, whether it is the servants or the, the believers, because he that believes a prophet in the name of a prophet receives a prophet re reward. He that receives a good man in the name of a good man receives a good man's reward. So therefore, but when he gives the parable, remember, it's an illustration. Because in that parable, in that illustration, when he talks about giving the, the, the talents, he gave one five, and he increased five, didn't he? He gave one, and he increased by one. That's a ratio of one to one, isn't it? But when he speaks about the parable in Luke, the parable in Luke chapter 19 and Luke chapter 12 does not have its origin in 33 AD. It has its origin from 1963 onward. Because it says, after the good man had returned, having received the kingdom, he came and he delivered pounds. Now in the parable, the Lord makes a distinction between pounds and talents. But it's only in the aspect of one, the, the talents was to portray in the early, from the beginning of the grace age, while the other one is at the end of the grace age. And when you talk about those receiving the pounds in Luke chapter 19, he says, he gave one that had one pound, he gained 10. Another one, he gave one pound and he gave five. And when you put them all together, the ratio is seven to one. Which actually brings out the point that here at the end time, there would be sevenfold more light. Now, what are these pounds and these talents? 
It's all related to revelation. And so therefore, when we look at Matthew 25, God gave, yes, those in that hour, a one-to-one ratio. It's not he gave him one revelation. But it's in respect of the plan of God, it was a one-to-one ratio. But at the end time, in Luke chapter 19, it would be a seven-fold more light. Which goes hand in hand with what Isaiah was speaking about in, the, in that day of the hour. So Jesus had some knowledge because in order to speak this parable it's not saying well father okay you say, he, like you would read a script he says and he, you read it in a parable form. He had to have some understanding to a certain point all of, the reason I'm bringing this in is in this manner. Yet, when Jesus was filled with the Spirit in the river of Jordan, with all the qualities, God gave him a fair amount of understanding. But then we go on a little further in 96 AD, and now we're in the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, as he's now, as an angel is bringing this to, to John, the apostle, on the Isle of Patmos, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, in other words, what Jesus had, now is the revel, in revelatory understanding. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, not in the river of Jordan now, because otherwise he would have spoke some of those things then. But now he's speaking about the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his servants, plural, not just one, things which must shortly come to pass. And he signified it by an angel to John. So in other words, Jesus put it this way. In 96 AD, the Father gives Jesus more understanding of uh, what's going to be happening in that book of Revelation because it has to do with the grace age and the plan of the finishing plan of God. Well, why would it be important for him to receive it then? Because he's high priest. He has to know what's going on. And so as the Father gives that to him, and he says that blessed is he, if you want to, yeah, blessed is he that readeth and understandeth, that was not in 96 AD. Yes, they understood it. It's something that was just, if you want to, from an a intellectual point of view. Yeah, there were seven churches that they depict in those, but they were used as types. But the revelation of it only started to come in 1963 onward. And so in 1963, now God has opened up a whole lot of things. But this was given to Jesus in 96 AD. And he was holding its revelation of it till 1963. But God got, sent, got Jesus to send an angel to send it down to John, the apostle, so that you and I could have this love letter that's for only for the bride here at the end time. And blessed he that readeth and understandeth, and keepeth those things therein, for the time is at hand. Now, he wanted to show to John, John was the one that recorded it in 96 AD. But a lot of things John recorded was the future from his day. He was brought in the spirit, and he saw our day. My goodness. What? I wonder what John saw and how it meant to him. Because uh, he could, Jesus could only, or God could only allow him to see things that he could relate to his mind to write things down. So now as we have this book of Revelation. Blessed are those servants, plural. 
Now there goes hand in hand with the three watches. If it was one servant that he would show that would read and understand, we would know that would have to be Brother Branham. He's the messenger. But because it says servants plural, and you'll find that in Revelation chapter 19 as well, because it talks about servants plural. Uh, chapter 20, I should say. No, I guess it's yeah, 19, sorry. And how God is here at the end of time would show unto his servants, plural. It's just to show, it's to confirm that when, in chapter 1, when he says that it was sent to John to show to the servants, it was not just the servants in the early church. It was mainly meant to be the servants here at the end time, plural. And I'm glad that he puts in that it was plural. Because if it was just one servant, then Brother Jackson couldn't have been one. Or even in his third watch, that whoever God's using in this, in this hour. And so therefore, in 96 AD, when the Father had finished in heaven, given to to Jesus, his only begotten son, all the under, understanding of things that need to be written in that book of Revelation. He sent an angel to signify to John, and he said it was to show his servants. But in time, when the book needed to be opened, we are the recipient in this hour. These scriptures are coming off the pages, and God is actually in this hour, has been since 1963 bringing new and fresh revelation. I was just, um, went on YouTube and I see there's a lot of messages Brother Branham has there. So I thought I'd look on the one that he was speaking about, the questions and answers. And this is in 1964, just a year before he died. And I went searching through all his sermons, because you, I ha you can have that, you can search all his sermons with a word processor and there's this is the only place I could find that he actually speaks it and this clearly in this way and I can see where Brother Jackson would have gotten it at that time it was not in a sermon but it was questions and answers that he was giving out and he says here what is the carcass he's speaking about Matthew chapter 24 verse 27 or 28 the carcass is what eagle feeds on. It took a prophet really to break that open because if you ask the denomination what's eating the carcass, they have no clue. They, some, they refer to buzzard or something, I don't know, whatever they think. But anyway, he says, the carcass is what eagle feeds on. Now, an eagle is considered in the Bible a prophet. An eagle is a, prophet, is a foreseeing bird, right? He says, a prophet is an eagle. God calls himself an eagle. Well, in a sense, because of the eagle age that we're living in, through that eagle. And he says, we're eaglets, small eagles. Then the believers, you see... And what is the carcass that they feed on? It's the Word of God. Wherever the Word of God is, is, the true nature of the bird will show itself. See, an eagle wants 
And we'll always want fresh meat. And he must have fresh meat. Isn't that what brought things down through the three watches? Is the fresh meat? Now and he goes on and says, It's not a buzzard. A buzzard is not an eagle. He don't eat on fresh meat. He don't, a buzzard don't live on fresh meat. It's on past Ted's meat. And so the bride in this hour, what causes you and I to be alive in the word of God? What gives it life? It's the fresh revelation that God opens up on ground in your day and in your hour. Now, if we go back to the days of Martin Luther, the just shall live by faith, that was fresh meat to them. It will always have its place in the Word of God. But you and I live in this hour. That is not fresh meat to us. It may be fresh meat to a sinner that comes to the Lord and he needs to know what justification by faith is. But if you were just going to eat the justification by faith day in, day out for 10, 15 years, no longer fresh meat. A buzzard will play with that. A denominational chicken will play with it. He'll be happy just to stay there. He don't want no fresh meat because he don't want to move on. And and what fresh meat will do will cause you to take some things off that we shouldn't have and grow into something we need to. So I, I found that kind of interesting when here he is at the end of his ministry. Brother Branham in 64. And God gets him to open that revelation and what that carcass is about. I would have thought he, he might have touched it in 63 or something in those, in those years. And so therefore from that just him answering an answer to a question. Now an apostle picks that up and brings it into a message. How wonderful. I don't know about you when you read about the carcass was where the eagles gathered together. And the eagles, according to Brother Jackson, is going to feed on that carcass till that seventh seal is broke. The question bids today, what are you feeding on today? I'm thankful God has not closed the tap of revelation. And again, no, we don't have a revelation every day here. How many know that? But God elaborates. He put a little bit here, a little bit there. So there has to be some fresh meat to keep the bride alive. It's what keeps you alive. Is I go back to one minister talked one day he was talking about he just got married and his wife made some nice porridge for him and starts eating the porridge oh dear that's good well she she figured well he likes that okay I'll make it every morning just because it's to show I love him well after a month she brings the porridge on the plate he takes the plate and he throws it out. <laughs> he had enough of fresh porridge. It was fresh when it started. But after a while, you need a change of menu to be fed, to be alive. It's, it's like a new car. Oh my, how shiny that thing is. He'll demand I'll polish it and do watch it and uh, do every t- everything just fine. And women have their little toys too. They're not leaving you out. And how that's going to be so wonderful and so beautiful. But then five years down the road, well, so what if it's dirty? It's just a car. The shine's gone out. The life out of it, of, of it being enthusing you, is gone. That don't mean the car was not any good. But it was still the car. But it didn't have the same appeal 
It was when you got that new car. Now, some women like new cars, too. Right? Now, I'm not saying here we have to get new cars. It's, I'm using that as a type concerning the Word of God. So after 13 years, somewhere there has to be some fresh meat. I'd have to say there have to be fresh meat at least once every year. Because just like today's society, you can change your car almost every year. Hmm? Oh, yeah. I mean, I just keep it till it runs down and have to get rid of it. But that's, that's not here or there. So this morning, God is the creator. He holds all the power. He knows every thought, everything. He's everywhere. Angels can't be that. Because angel has to get direction from him to go do their work. And when an angel speaks, that power comes from God to begin with. And so is it with Jesus. And so it is with the saints if God has given you a gift to operate a gift. That's why we can't just take, oh, here's the word says this. Oh, okay. It happened once there. I can take that by faith and I'm going to make that operate. That's a terror that would speak to you that way. But when God speaks, oh my. And the reason I'm looking at it in this way, there's coming up the road here. Before this bride leaves, God is going to speak to someone like he did to those of the early church. And we best be ready to know how to handle it and how to walk with it, when to say it, and when not to do things. And that's not just on the preacher, that's on every child of God, whoever God wants to give and use those gifts through. I'm waiting. <laughs> well, thank, thank God for, for truth. There's been some development in the world, just to finish this off with. Since 1962, the world was kind of looking at Russia and the United States having those nuclear missiles that they could destroy one another. Then they got to the place where, as computers advanced, they could more or less now put in other missiles. They could take out those missiles and render them useless as far as coming intercontinental wise. And so that backed off when they realized that, then they started signing agreements to, to uh, limit nuclear weapons in the world. But there's always some that wants to push the limits. Uh, you had Reagan want to put Star Wars in, this, in space, they're shooting them from there. But Russia has now developed something that the Americans got surprised with. They're developing a submarine. Unmanned. It's a nuclear missile torpedo. And because it's unmanned, that sub can dive deeper than any other sun, sub because you don't, have to, you don't need the room for human life. They can drop down to 3,000 feet below the water. And the purpose is they can send this tor missile torpedo through the water at over 100 kilometers an hour. It can travel 6,000 kilometers. The yield that they're looking at is a fair big size nuclear weapon and what they're not going to go underwater and launch it in the air to go up because then there is that still that defense that could take things out. But the, the thinking is this torpedo would come maybe 20 miles offshore or whatnot in the deep water, explode itself. It would cause a tidal wave of 500 meters high and could take out the city of New York. 
and there's no way to detect it because it's so deep in the waters, man does not have the technology to detect something that deep. So the Americans would be defenseless in to stop it. Now, granted, that would only be on your shores, on the sides. It's, um, it would cause a tsunami of 500 feet high, of 500 meters. That's pretty high. No city would, would survive, or it would kill, it would kill more human flesh than if an actual nuclear weapon hit the, uh, landed on, on the ground, because that big wall of water can destroy things pretty quick. So that's the world we're living in. It's, but now don't be scared. Now, if you're not saved, yeah, I, I can see you might have reason to be scared. But if you know the word of God, there's no way in the world that this world can go into a nuclear war and have the population annihilated because you wouldn't have the weak of Daniel. And it's the Lord's going to come and destroy the wicked. Not, yes, there's going to be an Armageddon. Yes, there's going to be some loss of life back there. But that's at the end of the week. God allows that to take, to take place. But we know there's going to be a rapture. That's our hope. I don't care what kind of weapon they, they want to bring out there. We're going in a rapture. <laughs> We're not going to be radiated to be put in a rapture. The, that has to be held off no matter what mankind thinks is going to take place. Now the other approach, Trump wants to make smaller nuclear weapons that can not kill so much that they can go in and destroy certain, like North Korea or places like that. Now they have weapons I've seen, I seen a, an article on, on the nuclear weapons. I'm rambling on there. I'm just going to finish with this. Man has developed, the first one was an atomic bomb, which is radiation, all kinds. But it wasn't very powerful, only two kilotons and whatnot. That's the atomic bomb. Then they developed the hydrogen bomb, which not was just a few kilotons, but now 25 megatons. That's your hydrogen bomb. But in the development, of course, of developing things, they went and they've discovered that they can make a neutron bomb, not as powerful as the hydrogen, but this radiation, you can go in and take the place 16 hours after. You don't have to wait 100 years for the radiation to go down. <laughs> and as they were saying, he says, they got so gung-ho in when they were bring, trying to make different nuclear weapons, one scientist came to one of the, his leaders and says, we can make it a, a, a small hydrogen bomb in a grenade. And the guy says, who's the idiot going to throw it? <laughs> <laughs> they weren't thinking. They were just thinking, we've got to miniaturize it, miniaturize it. Well, <laughs> common sense sometimes goes out the window. And God uses a lot of common sense in his word. Okay, let's just stand at this time. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, once again for what you have in your word, Lord. We know, Lord, that according to your word, no matter what man does, you will have your word fulfilled as it is written. And I thank you, Lord, this morning. Use the words that were spoken as you would see fit. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated. If, if we'll just maybe play one. Someone still has a need. And Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I had a dream, Brother Jackson was alive, and I had a dream of this great big eagle. He took almost a whole sky. And there was a perfect square that was in black, and this eagle was looking down through that square down here. And I knew the great eagle was. God himself, great eagle. But I couldn't understand the square, what it meant. 
and I picked up a container and Brother Jackson explained what the square was. And I remember that he said the square represents the whole plan of redemption. And I was so happy when I read that in the container because for a long, long time I couldn't understand it, but I just left it alone. And I picked up the container and he explained the whole thing about it. So God knows. He knows when and what we need in certain times. you'd come and dismiss us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, that we have a place to assemble ourselves together. Lord, thank you for your mercy and your grace. And Lord, for the fresh meat that you give us. Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us no matter what happens, Lord, that we just keep walking on with you. And Lord, I'm thankful for this ministry. And Lord, I also pray for the little country of Israel. And any that are sick and afflicted, Lord, you know all about it. We can't do anything in ourselves. We can't heal anyone, but Lord, you can. I just ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.